So my name is Melody, um, and uh, growing up, I was not brought up in church. Uh, we would only go to church on Christmas and Easter, Christers. And um, it was around the age of 12 that I began to go to church with my mom, and she really dove in. She really started to give her heart to the Lord, and I was like, awesome, I want to be like mom. Um, but like a year later, she stopped. And I remember she said, do you want me to drop you off? I can take you to church. And I'm like 13, like, uh, yeah, I guess. And so she would drop me off. And I remember getting to a place where I was like, I don't know if I want to do this church thing anymore. I'm 13. I'm going by myself. My brother and sisters don't even go with me. And that day, my youth pastor called me up to the back and said, hey, I have a word for you. The Lord put you on my heart. I was praying for you. And he gave me something to tell you. And I'm like, what? Like, God spoke to you about me? Like, he does that, you know? And uh, he's like, yeah, um, when I was praying for you, I saw this image of you running a race, but everybody around you stopped running. But you didn't. And as you were running, you ran all the way, and you saw the face of Jesus. And I'm like, oh, that's what I'm going through. And he said, I want to encourage you, don't stop running. And I was like, okay. And I remember him opening Isaiah 43, and he said, Melody, God has called you by name. You will go through the fire, and you will not be burned. You will go through the waters, and you will not drown. God has called you. He's going to use you. You're going to be in the ministry. I was 13. I was like, awesome, what is that? He's like, oh, uh, well, God's going to use you to do something for him. Maybe you'll be a missionary. I'm like, that's awesome. What is that? He's like, oh, uh, it's, it's people who are used, set apart for God's glory to share the gospel. And I'm like, oh, okay. Mom picks me up from church. How is church? I'm like, it's great. I'm going to be a missionary. She's like, who told you that? Say, I'm Puerto Rican. My mom is a little sassy. And so my mom was like, who told you that? I was like, Pastor Chris. She's like, you don't want to be a missionary? I was like, why? She's like, they don't make any money. I was like, oh, I don't want to be a missionary. And so <laughs> that was my life. I would get one message at church, one message at home. And so I had to learn early on to decide what is truth and what is a lie. And the only way you're going to know what is the truth versus a lie is through the word of God. And what the word of God is, is the Bible. And so it was at that age that I said, I have to follow truth. Jesus and not my family and that was really hard and so keep going forward when I was 15 years old I see some young people here you can relate I was like I was a party girl I love to party and shake my tail feather I don't know what y'all call it now juking or something I don't know and so I remember being at this one party dancing and all of a sudden it was like I entered a twilight zone it was like it was like slow motion. And in that moment, I started to see things the way it really was. And God was like, what are you doing here? And I'm like, I'm not doing nothing wrong, right? <laughs> and then I started listening to the music and what it was saying. And I'm like, yeah, that doesn't exactly glorify you. And God's like, who are you glorifying here? And it was at that moment I started to see God wanted me to give up some things. Because I loved him, I said yes. Because when you love him, you will obey him. And I remember him starting to change my desires. And my mom started to get worried. Don't get all fanatical now. And I was like, it's not, a, it's not fanatical, mom. I really love Jesus. And I don't care for these things anymore. And I started to change. And then at 16, I heard a message about sexual purity and that I could wait until marriage. I didn't think that was even possible. But I made that decision at 16. And then 17, he wanted more and more of me. And then 18, I go into a Bible college, and there's all these men of God. And I'm like, oh, Lord, who is he? Is it him? Is it him? I started to think everybody was the one. <laughs> and when I would see a guy with a girlfriend, I'm like, oh, I'm breaking up with you in my head, right? And then finally, this guy pursues me, and I thought he was it, you know? But not every good, godly guy is your guy not God's guy, and drove into this relationship, but I knew that if I stayed with this guy, I would give up my calling in life. I knew that. But I love this guy. But I love Jesus. 
And I remember the Lord telling me very clearly, you need to break up with him. Because if you stay with him, you're not going to have the call that I have on your life. It was such a hard moment. It was one of the hardest moments of my life because I knew that if I didn't make this decision, my whole life was going to be different. I broke up with that guy, and I was messed up. It took me a year to get over him. I truly knew what real heartbreak was. But it was the most painful peace I've ever had because I knew I was obeying Jesus. I broke up with him, and I said, God, whatever you want, Lord, what do you want? He said, I want you to be single. I said, let's pray again. Father, <laughs> whatever you want, Jesus. I said, I want you to be single. I'm like, man, the devil is talking. Lord. And he put it very clearly on my heart. I want you to be single till you're 27 years old. I was 20 at the time. I'm like, seven years? Who does that, God? Like, how can you put that on me? I'm going to die. You're not going to die. But when you're 20, you think you're going to die. And I said, yes, Lord. Seven years, I was single on purpose. Guys were like, yo, I want to get to know you. I'm like, cool, call me in seven years. And um, <laughs> fast forward now, I'm 24 years old. I'm like dying, right? I'm like loving Jesus, serving him. But all my friends are getting married, and I had a crisis. I'm with my dad, who's now a man of God, and he's like, why are you crying? I was like, Dad, because all the good men are running out. <laughs> There's not going to be any left. And he walks outside of the room, and he comes back with a world map. He's like, you don't think God has a man for you in this big old world? I'm like, <laughs> China, I don't know. And he's like, God has a man for you. We're going to pray for him. You're going to get a journal, and you're going to start praying for your future husband. And God is going to bless you, Melody, and you guys are going to do great things. I'm like, okay. So I bought this journal to the unknown man of God. <laughs> this feels weird. <laughs> and I would write prayers for him. And I always prayed, God, I pray me and him be a team for your glory. Amen. And so fast forward, a year, two years later, I'm in Uganda, Africa. And I meet this guy. <laughs> and when I seen him, it wasn't instant love at first sight, okay? It wasn't like, Ooh. it wasn't like that. I didn't feel like that feeling, you know, when you have to, like, poop or something. You know what I mean? You're like, oh, he's the one. You know what I mean? I didn't have that feeling. Butterflies. <laughs> no butterflies. So I thought, clearly, this can't be it. But the more I got to know him on the trip, the more I saw his character. Everybody say character. And I saw that we were on mission. And I saw that he loved God like no other. So I'm going to let him share a little bit of his side. Amen. I have the thing. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Amen. My wife is hilarious. <laughs> So um, it's funny, my story is kind of the opposite. You know, she says that she, grew, she didn't grow up in church. I did grow up in church. Um, I grew up in Roman Catholic Church, and um, my parents took us to church all the time. And um, with that kind of a background, I was exposed to the gospel to some degree, and my parents kind of brought me up in right and wrong and, and, and really held a high standard for me. So high school for me was pretty okay, pretty decent. I played sports. I did all these things. I was a kind of a popular kid, but I only had a couple of girlfriends. I didn't do anything kind of crazy, anything like that at all. But then when I went to college, I ended up going to the University of Arizona. And the uh, University of Arizona is very hot, and it's considered a party school, and everybody just shows up naked because it's too hot. I'm just kidding. But that's kind of the way it felt on that campus. And um, I got exposed to this party lifestyle very, very early. Freshman year, we dive in really quick, and um, I'm being invited to the clubs and to the parties and to the after parties. And uh, to kind of make matters worse, I, I joined a fraternity. Are you guys familiar with fraternities? This is one of those fraternities that do the step shows, and you got a line of people and whatnot, and they're like, attention, five, six, seven, eight, ah, ah. Right? <laughs> and uh, we're getting all this applause, and I'm getting all this attention, and it feels so cool. All the guys, they're like, hey, bro, I want to join you, Fred. I want to hang out with you. I'm like, yeah, 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 you know? All the girls are like, oh, my God, he's so cute. I want to hang out with you. And I'm like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah. 
And I didn't know what to do with all of this attention all of a sudden. And I'm being invited into parties and, you know, uh, moments with people. And next thing you know, I'm um, being pursued by this young lady who I really didn't know so much at all. She gives me a call late at night, wants to hang out. There's nothing to do in your dorm room. Don't ever have people in your dorm room. That just doesn't make any sense. And unfortunately, one thing led to another. And I gave her my virginity at 19 years old. And... I immediately regretted it because it wasn't the way that I was taught by my mom and my dad. It wasn't the way that they had set a vision for. And so I had this lie enter my mind, well, who waits for their second time? Might as well just have fun. And this lie of might as well have fun took a hold of me and I dove in deep into this dark world of just partying all night long, getting into drugs, starting to drink and sleeping around. And as much fun as we said we were having, I was growing in depression and I didn't even know it. I grew into insomnia and I couldn't sleep and I knew something had to change. You know, something's messed up when you start entertaining suicidal thoughts. And, and this, was, this was attacking me. And in hindsight, I, I see that the enemy was attacking me. And I didn't even know it. You know, sometimes the enemy can see what God's plans for you are a little bit further than you can. And he tries to intervene and cut it short. Well, I had no clue of that at the time, but God was moving too. And he started sending people my way who would invite me to church. And I didn't really want to go, but just to kind of please them, I decided to go one day. And I hear the gospel. I get reacquainted with Jesus Christ. And it started to make sense to me the, the value of him dying on the cross. See, I grew up with this all my life, but I didn't understand the value of it. That Jesus Christ died for my sins. And I think maybe now all of a sudden I had these loud pronouncing sins. But even the sins from within, he died for those. Do you know those judgmental thoughts that we carry? Or those, those evil ideas, you know, you want to just kind of take a little something, something, or conceal a truth or gossip, or whatever it might be. He died for all of that on the cross, and his blood covers me, and now I have this freedom to come before God, and his resurrection promises me that I will live forever. In fact, that same spirit that rose in from the dead entered me. And so I was learning these things, and in my dorm room, I was reading Matthew Chapter 5, verse 27, it says, If you so much as even look at a woman with lust in your heart, remember the inner things, you've already committed adultery. And I'm like, what? I didn't even touch no other man's wife. What you talking about? And Jesus is staring at me in the face through the word and saying, you're an adulterer. And he talks about how, you know, pluck out your eye, cut off your hand. Uh, this could lead you to hell. And I'm like, I don't want to go to hell. And I have this confrontation, this loving confrontation with God in my dorm room, and I surrender. I surrender my life to Jesus Christ right there in my dorm room, and it was a radical transformation. I was taught early on to read the Bible every day and pray. I, about a year and a half times, I had read through it a lot. Some scriptures stuck out to me, 1 Corinthians 6, that my body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, and I was like, man, I cannot continue in this kind of sin. I'm, I'm taking Jesus with me in this, and so that lie that you can't start over was kicked out, and I said, I am been brand new. I am a new creation in Jesus Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, right? And so, 17. And so I've been transformed in him, and so now I'm walking afresh and anew. And uh, then I get to Ephesians 5, 3, and it says that among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality. And I'm like, dang, not even a hint. Okay, cool, what should I do? Um, as a man, I want to protect and cover women. I don't want their reputation messed up. I don't want my reputation messed up. So I'm not even going to find myself alone with a woman. So I created that boundary to walk with God. And so then I heard... Um, you know, be holy for I'm holy. He said, as dear children of God, he says, be holy for I'm holy. And I'm like, man, Lord, how could I be holy in this? And the thought that came to my mind, this is just a conviction that came to me. He said, how about you not kiss another woman until you get married? I was like, whoa, hey, that's a little much, Papa. What's going on? And it stuck with me, and it stuck with me, and it stuck with me. And I was like, okay, cool. I give up this, this pursuit of, of, in, of engaging with a dating partner or anybody like that at all. The Lord was just refining me. And one more 
he says, hey, you're bugging me a lot about your future marriage because I was praying about a lot that. And he says, why don't you just give up that right to be married? And then he says, Psalm 37, 4, delight in me and I'll give you the desires of your heart. Just delight in me and you don't even know what's in your heart. Just trust me. And I wrestled with him about four days about that, but then I went ahead and I yielded. And the Lord was just calling me deeper, calling me deeper. And it was uncomfortable. But my pre my, the times in his prayer and presence was so sweet. It was a beautiful exchange like Hillsong Song says, right? And so get some few years later, and I get invited to go to Uganda, Africa on a mission trip. And this is exciting. I'm going back to the motherland, you know? And I meet this young lady, and I had this pact with God that I'm giving up my rights, so I actually tried to avoid her. Every time I saw her, and I thought she was kind of cute, I was like, she cute. I'm going to walk over here. <laughs> and every day we would have to talk with logistics and things of that nature, and I would keep it friendly, find myself flirting a little too much, and pull away. And night after night, I'm like, man, this is a distraction. Oh, God, please send her to another part of the mission so that I can focus. He answered my prayer the next day. She was sent to the other side of the city at one church. I was sent to another side of the city in a school. But we had to come back. And at the end of that day, we were talking logistics again. And I found myself looking at her and I said, wow, you are beautiful. And she said, what did you just say? I said, did I just say that out loud right now? And that night I'm praying, I'm like, oh, God, I can't believe I just said that out loud. I'm making a fool of myself. This is of the devil. And I feel this caution, like, she's not of the devil. I'm like, I know she's not of the devil. I'm just saying. And, and the Lord, I just felt this peace, like, hey, why don't you just be her friend? Chill out. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. This is the first time you've ever insinuated that I could be a lady's friend. Is this my wife? You know, I want to jump the gun. He's like, whoa, whoa, slow down, slow down. So everybody thought she was crazy. Everybody thinks I'm crazy, so I thought, why don't we just be crazy together, and I pursued a friendship with her. And so we got to know each other. Um, he asked for my phone number and said, hey, I know that you have a year left of your vow, and I don't want to interrupt what you're doing for God. Do you think maybe we could just be friends for a year? I was on the phone like, yeah, we can do that. <laughs> you know, got to keep it calm on the phone, girls. And... Um, so we were friends for a year, and a year uh, later, the Lord allowed him to visit me in Chicago, and he spoke to my father, got permission to pursue me, and got, found a job, found an apartment, took about six months, it was a long six months, and he drove from hot Tucson to cold, freezing Chicago, and we started our dating courtship relationship, and he said, I'm not going to kiss you to our wedding day, and I was like, you really meant that though? He's like, yeah. And you know what? That protected us. Fast forward seven months later, we were in Florida visiting his mom, and he wrote on the sand, Sunny Isles Beach, W-Y-M-M. -M. And I was like, I wonder what that stands for. <laughs> and there was a big X in the sand, and he said, will you marry me? X marks the spot. There's a treasure in there. And I was like, ah! And there was this box, and I opened it, and it's empty. I'm like, Sidney, stop playing with me. He's like, okay, no, for real, for real. And he pulls out this black velvet box. He says, will you marry me? And I said, yes. And it was just so beautiful. As we prepared for our wedding day four months later, I believe in long courtships and short engagements. And um, as we were getting ready, my friend of mine said, man, we really should do a story on you guys. So she writes a press release. She was interning with CNN, and she writes, 28-year-old Latina remains a virgin till her wedding day. And she didn't die. No. Uh, yeah, she puts this out there. And we start getting calls from Fox News, Chicago Tribune, Chicago Sun-Times. And they are at our wedding. And the day that we said, I do, everyone was there. And it was absolutely beautiful. <sighs> to God be the glory. To God be the glory. The next day, we find out our story went viral went to China, Denmark, France, all over the country. And we just share this story to you because our message today is give it all to him. That's right. Give when it When you give it all to him, you have no clue what he has for you. Mm. You have no clue what is on the other side of your obedience. The enemy will lie to you, kick and shout to not give it all. But it is a total lie because when you lose your life is when you truly gain it. Amen. 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 So we're going to read from 
Mark chapter 10, starting at verse 17. It should come up on the screen. And uh, it's a story about the rich man. We're reading from the NLT, and it says, As Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem, a man came running up to him, knelt down, and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus asked. Only God is truly good. Do you know why Jesus asked that question? Because he's trying to get the guy to recognize who he's talking to. You're coming to me. You're calling me good. Are you insinuating that I'm God? Because only God is good. He's giving him perspective. Who are you talking to? And, uh, but 19, but to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. You must not cheat anyone. Honor your father and mother. 20, teacher, the man replied. I've obeyed all these commandments since I was young. Looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. There is still one thing you haven't done, he told him. Go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. Okay. At this time, the man's face fell, and he went away sad, for he had many possessions. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter into the kingdom of God. Now this amazed them. But Jesus said again, dear children, it is very hard to enter into the kingdom of God. In fact, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were astounded. Then who in the world can be saved, they asked. Jesus looked at them intently and said, humanly speaking, it is impossible, but not with God. Everything is possible with God. Pause for a second. Now, Jesus had recounted elements of the law to the rich man. And he's saying to the rich man, you know, Jesus has a way of communicating to get you to a place to understand where he's actually going to go. Do you ever recognize that a lot of times the Pharisees would ask him a question and he would answer them but not answer the question? He's trying to get them to where they actually need to be. And so when he says to the rich man, hey, okay, go ahead, follow the commandments, Jesus knows very well that no one can enter the kingdom of God by following the commandments. So right now when he says, humanly speaking, it is impossible, even after recounting the law and saying, hey, go ahead, if you want to keep the law, go ahead. This is what will get you into the kingdom of God, knowing very well it's impossible. But where was he trying to get them? He was trying to get them to the second statement. But with God, but not with God. Everything is possible with God. Because it's God who saves. It's God who draws us near. Our responsibility is to respond. So, when Jesus had said to the rich young ruler sell all your possessions, give it to the poor, you'll have treasures in heaven, take up your cross and come follow me. That's how you get saved. The rich young man, he walked away and he missed the whole thing. When he asked that first question, who do you call, why are you calling me good? He missed it. When he says, hey, go ahead and fulfill the law, he missed it. When he said, go sell all your possessions and you'll have treasures in heaven, he missed it. And when he said, Come, take up your cross and follow me. He missed it. Because his eyes were on the things that Jesus told him to get rid of. Now, this is the rich young ruler, the rich man. So he had riches, and Jesus went after that. Maybe we're not rich. I I'm not rich. <laughs> My wife and I are not rich. But you've heard the things that he called us. He, 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 he spoke to us. Give get the dancing up. Give the drugs and the alcohol up. Come follow me. Let's go even deeper. Uh, give up uh, uh, being alone with women and enjoying flirting. Uh, give up uh, kissing. 
Why don't you just give up marriage? Take up your cross and come follow me. He's going to speak to us specifically of the things that he is calling us to give up. I'm not, there are rich people in the kingdom of heaven who use their riches for God as called by God to do so. This has nothing to do with riches. This has to do with the call of God and the cost that he's calling you to yield to follow him. Okay, so uh, verse 28, did you, did you want to come? Yeah. Okay. When I was reading this, um, this part where it said in verse 21, Jesus felt genuine love for him. I started to get a little emotional because I started to think about, man, God, you love this man. You love him. And so when you, he told him, you know, give up, give it all up. Give it to the poor. Come on, come follow me. He thought about it like, ah, I can't do that. I can't do that. And so what I saw there was that he loved, Jesus loved him, but the man didn't love Jesus. Mm. He was just obeying the rules. I do this, I do this, I do this. Okay, cool. Give it all up and come follow me. Uh, he got sad. And I thought how crazy it was that he walked away sad and Jesus didn't go, no, that's okay, it's okay. You don't, you don't got to give it all up. Just come, just come. Just come with us. No. Jesus let him walk away sad because he knew where his treasure really was. The issue is our treasure. Is Jesus your treasure? Is Jesus really your treasure? How many of us have walked away sad when the Lord has asked us to do something? I thought about what if the rich young ruler had not obeyed but still been around the disciples, stuck around, did church service, right? He would still be in disobedience. He would still not be in the kingdom. But he's like, hey, Jesus, I'm here. I'm singing all the songs. He said, but you still haven't given me your treasure. Because where your treasure is, there's your heart. And I want your heart. I don't want your songs. I want your heart. And that's what he wants for us. And then I started to think, man, love will, co will cost you everything. It will cost you everything. There were two brothers in the Bible, one that said he'd obey but then didn't. And then the other brother said, I won't but then did. And Jesus said, who's, who's the real obedient one? The one who did. The one who obeyed. And so Jesus felt genuine love, but the young ruler did not really love Jesus. And so my, my thing that I saw is that the real tragedy of the rich young ruler is that he will never know what he missed out on. He will never know what could have happened if he would have gave it all up. Who knows? Maybe he would have gave it all back to him. Mm. Who knows? And Peter's like, man, we gave it all to you. The cost of following Christ is great, but the cost of not following Christ is even greater. Yes. So continuing on, as my wife referenced, Peter is aghast. It says in verse 28, then Peter began to speak up. We've given up everything to follow you. Yes, Jesus said, and I assure you that everyone who has given up house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or property for my sake and for the good news will receive now in return a hundred. Now, this version says a hundred times, but actually it, the word is a hundredfold. As many houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and property, along with persecution. I, I, I want to pause and explain what fold is. So I looked this up. What is a hundredfold? It doesn't exactly mean a hundred times. It means full measure of what you've planted. So you, it's an agricultural term. And so you go and you make all your rows, you know, you see them with the oxen or now they, we got the machines and it's digging it all up and then you're putting in your seed. And Jesus says that whatever you give up, 
Whatever you yield, it's like a seed into the kingdom of God. And everything you give up for Jesus will return 100-fold. 100-fold. So you got to think about this because in a seed is a tree that will bear fruit and have multiple more seeds which then now has the ability to plant multiple more trees. Do you see that this is exponential? This is more than a hundred times. That you can't even imagine how much more yield that crop would give you back. And so when he told the rich young ruler, give up all of your treasures, he's giving him a mag, ma uh, I can't even say that word, magnanimous opportunity. You have a lot. If you give up all of that, do you know how much you'll reap? It's a hundredfold. Mm. And then he says, along with persecution. Because you know, when you seek to go and follow Jesus like that, People will snicker and sneer and mock and jeer and make fun of you. The enemy will send people to dissuade you because he doesn't want you to step into everything that God has for you. And more so because when that seed dies and brings forth new life with the tree that bears much fruit, there's so much more seed in there, your life is intended to bless and touch many, many more thousands and millions. And so the enemy doesn't want you to know God, and he does not want that seed to have an effect on all those that God has intended. This is spiritual warfare. So that's why it comes with persecution. I am reminded when the, the, okay, the first invitation that's most important is when Jesus said, come follow me. I want you to know that as we follow Jesus, we come to crossroads where we have to follow him again yeah. and again yeah. and again. You'll, you'll be tested in your faith so that you have to give more and more and more. Uh, when I was young, uh, about 20 Seven in the beginning of the year 2006, I was reading a book called God Chasers. And in this book is testimony after testimony of people who had yielded whatever it is that the Spirit led them to yield so that they can have more of God. God chased. They were just chasing after God. And I'm reading this book, and I was in my, my bed, and, and I'm, I, I had to put it down at one point because there was this one story that just blessed my socks off. And I said, God, I want to know you like that. And I'm looking around my room for whatever reason, and, and my eyes, for some strange reason, fixates on my Xbox. And I'm like, well, what's up with that? And he's like, how about that? Give that up. Because in the story, this guy had given up on something extra. In fact, uh, quickly, the guy was talking about his mother, his grandmother, who always walked around with a Coke bottle and one day didn't have a Coke. And he said, Grandma, well, you, you don't have a Coke today. And she said, yeah, I gave it up. He's like, why? He said, because, because God whispered into my ear and said that if you give that up to me, I would reveal more of myself to you. And he's like, well, you gave it up? She's like, yeah. Did he reveal more of you, of himself to you? And he, she just smiled and walked away. Uh -huh. And he knew something happened. And so that was prompted me, like, well, what can I give up? And he said, give up that Xbox. And I'm like, but why? That's not extravagant. <laughs> to me, I didn't think that was extravagant. I wasn't playing video games all the time. I was actually using it to worship and play CDs and stuff like that. And he was like, well, you know, if it's not that big of a deal, then just give it up. And I'm arguing with the Lord, but wait, I don't understand. This is not that significant. He goes, then why are you arguing with me about it? And I go, and, and I'm arguing with some more. And then, you know, God is gracious. Just like he did with the rich young ruler, he stopped arguing with me. And he said, okay, fine. I felt that in my spirit. Like, okay, fine, we'll not have to talk about it no more. And I was like, wait, whoa, whoa, no, no, no. I don't want to be like that rich young ruler. He said, okay, fine, give it up. And I said, oh, okay. And so I made a plan. All right. 
I call up some friends, gonna make a little package deal, one more week, and I sold it for 100 bucks. I had a lot of things, it was worth way much more than that. And to this day, I know that I have probably experienced things in God because I just gave that thing up. Maybe it was with time, maybe it was with something else, and then interestingly enough, when I met Melody, she hates video games. <laughs> <laughs> maybe it was just to bless her. So when he tells me we're getting to know each other, He's like, I go, do you play video games? Because it's just a pet peeve of mine. And he's like, I didn't say that. I just said, do you play video games? He goes, nah, I gave that up. I actually don't play. The Lord told me to give it up. Oh, my, this is my husband, Lord. <laughs> and so that's just interesting how God worked that out as well. So, so now I ask all of us here, right, because it's, it's growing, it's growing, it's growing. Um, what are we missing out on because of our refusal to give it all? What is the little to big thing that God is calling you to yield so that he could reveal more of himself, number one, and his purposes for your life, number two, to you? So we continue. And in all the world, to come to that person will have eternal life. Jesus links eternal life to the yielding of whatever the Spirit prompts you and following him. Because do you notice that the apostles on a regular basis warn us to keep the faith? Do you know that you'll come to some of these crossroads that will tempt you so much that maybe you'll get off the track and not want to follow Jesus anymore? Just food for thought. But I implore you, Whatever the Holy Spirit is placing on your heart to yield, don't let it be something that you hold on to so much that it takes you off track. Yeah. I'm only repeating what the apostle said that said, keep the faith. He even says that some people's faith are shipwrecked, whether it be to holding on to certain false doctrines, because we know that false doctrines are coming in the last days. Because of pain and offenses, Jesus literally said, if you do not forgive, the heavenly father will not forgive you. He said the heavenly father. So he's talking to believers. I'm just warning you according to the scripture. I'm warning myself. And then it says, but many who are the greatest now will be the least important then. And those who seem least important now will be the greatest then. Guys, when you make these yieldings, you will feel so low. And it's a private matter. And you feel so insignificant. You know, there's this temptation to proclaim to the, to the hills, oh, I just gave up this thing for God. And then whatever praise you get from men about that, there's your reward. But when you keep it private and hidden between you and the Lord, and you feel like it's a little thing and you feel so low. In his eyes, you are poised for promotion. Again, I'll say it. The things that you do in private to give it all to God, he will make it public. In this life and the next, much reward in heaven. Are our eyes on heaven? Are we so concerned about the day today, even in ministry, yep. that we take our eyes off of Jesus and forget about heaven? And not just the place of heaven, but the person of heaven, eternity with Jesus Christ our Lord. See, this only makes sense to those who have tasted and seen that the Lord is good and hunger for more. The quote says, I, I'm taking a, I finished the class just before we came out to Hawaii, and it was about love that costs. And the quote said, love that is not costly is no love at all. Which brings me to my final thought. I was reminded about Mary in John 12 who, I won't refer to it, but you can make a note about it. I won't read it, but you can make a note about it. Jesus 
is in Bethany. He's hanging out with his friends. They want to spend time with him. And Mary wants to show her extravagant love, costly devotion. And she pours out a pound. My wife is in essential oils right now. I'm like starting to understand the magnitude of oil essences. She pours out a pound of oil upon her. If you know that oil oftentimes represents the Holy Spirit, I think that at some times it can, it can reflect our own spirit. She poured out her spirit on him and took her glory, which is her hair, and wiped his feet with her hair. And people looked back and they mocked and jeered and sneered and said, this could have been sold for a uh, and given to the poor because it's worth a year's worth of salary, 300 denarii. But she gave it all. Will we give it all? I was remembering two years ago, uh, plays the guitar, Mark? Is that Mark? Yes. He, um, two years ago when they were leading worship, I was worshiping, it was our last day, and I was just reflecting on all that God did, and I was just thanking him, and then he sings this song, he like, sings this song, uh, you are awesome in this place, mighty God, and there's this part that says, uh, pass the gates of praise into your sanctuary where we're standing face to face, I look upon your continents, I see the fullness of your grace. I can only bow down and say, you're awesome in this place. So he starts to sing this song. It's an old song. And I just break because that was a song that the Lord used when I was 15 years old. When I literally was at that breaking point of, was I going to give up my party life and my friends? And I remember in worship seeing Jesus at this gate, the gate was open, and it was just this bright light, and behind me were just the party darkness. I could see what was back there, but I couldn't see what was ahead, and all I knew Jesus was saying, come on, Melody, come on, I got things you don't even know about, but I was 15 years old, like, ah, ah, ah. and I remember that song in worship, me going, I give it all to you, God. So now here I was, 35 years old, in Hawaii. Mark starts singing this song. And I'm like, ah. if I never said yes, I wouldn't have been in Hawaii. If I never said yes, I would never have prayed for that young lady that I prayed for who gave her heart to Christ. If I had never said yes, guys, there are people, nations waiting for your yes waiting for your yes to God. But let's stand. Let's pray.